Welcome to Telling Tales, the place to get your fiction fix. In each episode, we'll have a story for you. Maybe you'll find yourself in a far-flung corner of the world, or deep in the French countryside, or even on the banks of the River Tyne. We'll take you to places where the past and the present merge. Rocks talk, and a curry can kill you. Sometimes funny, sometimes dark, but always entertaining. Welcome to Telling Tales. Jean-Luc's Secret Jean-Luc stepped out into the bright June sunshine and surveyed his empire. His cows grazed quietly on the rough pasture at the side of the valley, and all along the valley floor the sunflowers were thrusting skywards. He was as contented as any farmer could be called contented. There was still the worry of the loans from the bank, the uncertainty of the weather, and the unforgiving secret that grew like a cancer in his head. Everyone, he reasoned, had secrets. But John Luke's secret was like the boil that grew on his backside every harvest time. He knew that one day it would burst out, and it would poison the whole of the village. Like every village in this sleepy part of France, the one currency that everybody loved to invest in was gossip. They would gather outside the boulangerie and trade secrets like children in a playground swapping football cards. The coffee served up rumours with the thick black coffee and crumbs of information spilled out of the morning croissants. So he knew that as soon as he shared the smallest hint of his secret with anyone, even his wife, they would travel around the village faster than a fox after a fleeing chicken. He sighed, shrugged his shoulders and headed for his tractor. Not the new one, with its sat-nav and air conditioning, but the old Renault he'd inherited from his father. He hated the new tractor. It was everything he needed, and everything he hated. On the Renault, he was at one with the farm. He could smell the seasons change, catch the first whiff of problems in the fields, and hear the rustle of the rabbits chewing away at his vegetables. The new tractor made him feel remote and unconnected with the earth. It had doubled his productivity, and had attachments that took the back breaking work out of most of his tasks. But he didn't like it, like he did the old Renault. His father had taught him everything about that tractor. In winter, they would strip it down to its component parts, check every connection, grease and clean every coupling and linchpin. When the new tractor broke down, he had to get an engineer in from Toulouse. It would cost him a fortune and the repayments on the loan were soaking up his profits. Yet five metres away from where he was standing was the answer to all his problems. If only he could figure out a way to sort it out without shattering his world into a thousand problems and a million mistakes. He lowered the plough into the earth and slipped the cutch. There was a moment's hesitation as wheels gained traction and the engine eased the tractor forward. He loved ploughing. Turning the soil was what farming was all about. As he ploughed, his mind could wonder. How are the children doing at school? Will the price of sunflower seeds rise or fall? But mainly, he didn't like to think at all. He would just listen to the sound of the tractor, a screech of the buzzards circling about the newly ploughed furrows and the cicadas beating out their rhythm in the trees by the stream. And in those moments he felt himself merge into the land. He became one with the past, and the generations before him who had ploughed those fields and harvested their crops. Farmers are not known for making quick decisions. They like to weigh up all the options and consider all the different possibilities. 
Theirs was the long game. An action could have far-reaching consequences, and it was always best to take your time. And lost in the hum of his tractor, he remembered the morning four days earlier when he made his discovery. Had I been in the new tractor, he thought, I would have missed it. And first, it was nothing more than a glint, a flash of light at the corner of his eye. It wasn't till the second pass on that part of the field that he looked again at the newly turned earth. Stepping down from the tractor, he followed the trail of light, and bending over, he picked up a small piece of metal. Its beautiful deep gold colour, its softness in his hand, and the way the sunlight played across it. He knew it was gold. Although the only other piece of gold he'd ever seen was his wife's wedding ring, it was unmistakable. It looked as if someone had dropped it moments before he'd picked it up. But he knew that in this field, and in this place, that could not be true. It was a coin, but roughly stamped and almost crude in its symmetry. Not like the coins that waited neatly in the leather purse that he kept in his overalls. He slipped the coin into his pocket and got back on the tractor and continued with his work. On the next pass he looked again at the fractured earth where he had found the coin and there again he saw another flash of gold. Stopping again he went to pick up the coin but this time he looked more closely and soon he saw flashes of gold everywhere. The earth seemed to come alive with coins and everywhere he looked the coins grinned at him like flying ants that had emerged from the earth in columns of flight in the late spring. They were everywhere, and soon his pockets groaned with them. Hundreds of them, and still more came out of the ground. A frenzy had overtaken him, a delight as the ground gave up its treasure. He was giddy with excitement, his mind a whirl of questions, of possibilities. Wait till I tell my wife she'd be so pleased. Our money worries are over. I'll be free of the chains that hold me to the land. Those and a dozen other thoughts flitted across his mind like butterflies, and he laughed and he shouted and he screamed all at the same time. Jean-Luc took the plastic sack that covered his tractor seat and emptied his pockets into it and then he slumped down to the ground. He was not a very religious man, but like all farmers, he was a superstitious one. So he offered up a prayer to the Blessed Virgin and thanked God for his good fortune. And suddenly, his joy changed to panic. What, what to do next? Would the government have to know? The, the tax people, lawyers, the gendarmes? that corrupt and venal mare at his local village. Now before him, he could see a legion of people who'd wanted to deprive him of his good fortune. He was not a well-educated man, he was a farmer, and the world was full of people who always seemed to have their hands in his pockets. He must think carefully before he acts, consider everything, weigh up all the possibilities. In the meantime, he would tell no one. John Luke made his way to the corner of the field to the remains of the old barn. The roof had long gone, the walls robbed of their stone, and all that was left was the corner end of a wall. And in that corner, he hid his treasure, except for one coin that he put in his pocket. In his mind, there was the beginning of a plan, and this one coin would play its part. Five days later, Jean-Luc told his wife he was going to Toulouse. He told her he had a part for the new tractor to collect. He ranted and raved about the cost of this new part, how he could get parts for his old tractor any time locally, but the new tractor needed a trip to Toulouse, and he wasn't going to pay the robbing thieves from the tractor company their extortionate delivery charges. And as he drove along the motorway to Toulouse, he smiled to himself. He didn't realise what a good liar he could be. He congratulated himself on his ability to deceive his wife. All he needed to do now was to take the coin to the museum in Toulouse and have it valued. Since the fatal afternoon he found the coins, he reasoned he needed to find out exactly what he'd found. From the look of the coins, he guessed they were old, very old maybe, even Roman. 
He counted them, and there were two thousand four hundred and twenty of them. He had found only a few hundred on the first day, and over the next few days he carefully sifted through the soil until he was certain he had them all. Monsieur Duchamp, the curator of the Museum of Augustine, examined it. Uh, gold, and definitely Roman, a uh, gold solidus, dating from the reign of Constantine the Great, uh, hmm, about 310 A.D., it's in very good condition. Where did you find it? Jean-Luc shuffled his feet down at the carpet and said, uh, uh, On my farm I was ploughing and I saw it in the ground. Um, how much is it worth? Jean-Luc inquired, trying to sound as casual as possible. Oh, uh, about 40 euro. Jean-Luc did a quick calculation in his head and suddenly realised this hall was worth a 100,000 euro. Uh, if you find any more, let us know. As he drove home, he mused over his options. He could go back to the museum and tell them of this find, and but then there would be the army of archaeologists who descend on his farm. They'd probably stop him using the field for months, and he'd lose money. On the other hand, he'd be rich, and he wouldn't care. A hundred thousand euros, however he thought, was not enough. By the time he paid off his debts, paid off the taxman and the lawyers, there was precious little left for him. Jean-Luc had once met a man from Luzert, who had found a tiled Roman floor in his basement while the builders were installing some new plumbing. The work stopped as soon as he told the mayor. Officials from Montebon came and inspected the cellar. Then archaeologists arrived, and before he knew what was happening, all the work on the new plumbing had stopped and he refused access to his own cellar. It was months and months of disruption, and he never received a sou in compensation. He hated the idea of all those people coming to his farm. He hated the idea of all those people full stop. He'd have to talk to them and explain things, and they'd try to trick him out of his money. By the time Jean-Luc arrived home, he knew what he must do. In the corner of the old barn, he dug a deep hole and placed the coins in it. The next day, as he sat at his kitchen table, he realised he still had the coin he took to the museum in his pocket. He took it out and passed it to his wife. A present for you, my love, Jean-Luc told his wife. A coin I found in the field. I, I think it might be Roman. His wife picked it up, examined it carefully and thought, Hmm... It looks exactly like all the other coins I saw him bury in the corner of the old barn. If he thinks he can swindle me out of this gold, he must think I'm a bigger fool than he is. And she smiled, a knowing smile, and said, Ah, thank you, John Luke. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you want to find out more about Telling Tales, then email me at the address below. Or subscribe on your favourite podcast software. This is Jeff Price, and goodbye from Telling Tales. <laughs>